You are Locked On Kentucky, your daily podcast on the Kentucky Wildcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what is going on, Big Blue Nation? Welcome on in to Locked On Kentucky, your daily Kentucky Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Lance Dahl, writer for Sports Illustrated for various SEC-related things. But on this podcast, we take a dive into all things Kentucky athletics. On today's episode of Locked On Kentucky, we are going to be discussing what Kentucky basketball's lineup needs to look like next season. We're also going to tackle some more listener questions Uh, Some of those have to do with what happens here uh, with this rotation and this lineup. And then we're going to talk a little bit about maybe some other things going on outside of Kentucky basketball's program. Thank you so much for making Locked On Kentucky your first listen every single day. want to remind everybody out there that we are free and available on all platforms. If you've not subscribed, please go ahead and do so. We are officially over 4,000 subscribers. Really appreciate you guys. Really appreciate everybody in the comments that was uh, congratulating and uh, supporting uh, the channel for passing 4K. Let's keep it going. Let's keep it pushing. If you want to join the wagon, man, we got plenty of room here as we dive deeper into the off season, and it's going to be a great one. So you're going to want to subscribe. And if you're listening on podcasts, you're going to want to follow. It's going to be a great off season. Uh, just kind of hang out, talk, and hypothesize, hypothesize while wow, look at me go, and theorize about what's going to be happening for the uh, Kentucky Wildcats uh, here in the fall. So Zach Hamilton, one of the listeners of the show, hit us up, and he asked, could you run through what you think – the starting five will look like for Kentucky next season and who will be coming off the bench as role players. I certainly can, Zach. Now, here's the thing. You may see some, and and this is just me kind of perusing online and, and looking at different social media platforms. You could see some people break this down as your starting five and then your six, seven, eight, nine, and tenth man off the off the bench. You could do that. You could look at the rotation that way. I think that will probably, in terms of minutes, break it down what we think is going to happen for the Wildcats at some point this offseason, maybe more than once, uh, depending on how things move and shake. But for today's exercise, because he asked, what do you think the starting five will look like, and then who comes off the bench as the the role players, I'm going to apply it to the individual position groups, right? Instead of just saying, well, here's your sixth man, your seventh man, even though I think that it's pretty clear who's what uh, in this rotation. But anyway, I digress. Let's go ahead and dive into it. So at your point guard spot, I think you have Rob Dillingham as your starter. Now, you could have DJ Wagner here, depending on what happens, if there's injuries, knock on wood, or or whatnot. But I think Rob Dillingham is going to be your starting point guard at, at Kentucky. Again, you can rotate other guys in, but he's your number one. At the two spot, at the shooting guard spot, I've got DJ Wagner. Uh, I've got him starting there. I think that makes sense right now. Uh, I think your your backcourt is probably as solid as it gets um, in terms of just the fact that you've got depth there. Um, speaking of depth, we're going to talk about that later on the show. Somebody had a question about that, and I think it's a very good one. Uh, small forward. There are some, there's some conversation right now about Antonio Reeves and whether or not he will be able to return for the Kentucky Wildcats, whether or not he will. According to Jack Pilgrim of KSR, who just put out recently a massive article giving his intel on every single player that has either transferred, is in the process of transferring, is considering coming back, won't come back, maybe makes a decision. He he did a phenomenal job of just breaking down all the different things that these Wildcats have done over this past season and then kind of giving his thoughts and intel and information uh, about what's going on. It's a free article, Uh, that you can read if I'm not mistaken, unless I am just signed in to my On3 account and I don't realize it. I don't think I am, Um, but I I don't think I'm reading anything paid here uh, whenever I say, and this has been spread across the internet at this point, but according to Jack Pilgrim, Antonio Reeves doesn't really want to have to bother with kind of diving into the G League and the situation there and and trying to get through uh, the draft process and trying to find a two-way deal, yada, yada, yada. Point being, NIL and coming back for another season for Kentucky is a more lucrative deal right now. That was kind of the situation for Oscar Shibley last year, right? He doesn't want to have to try and find the way to work his, work things out, uh, potentially in the pros, whenever you, you could struggle. Why not make that million? Or two, or however much Shibley was going to make last year. Coming back for Kentucky, for Antonio Reeves, I don't know what his price is, uh, but I can only imagine it's high. The reason I bring this up here with Reeves is that I think he's going to come back. But the question here is, 
what does the small forward rotation look like? Does Justin Edwards end up starting at small forward or is it Antonio Reeves? Because this is something I think that we actually talked about like right after the season ended, um, just about a month or so ago, maybe a little bit before that. Because Justin Edwards at 180 pounds, I wouldn't want him at the four. Uh, in, in most rotations, and actually in all, almost all rotations, I probably would not want him at my power forward spot. Um, if it's a, like a definitive, hey, this is our four guy in this set we're about to run, or in this defense. And you may say, well, he's 6'7", 180 pounds. Chris Livingston was 6'7", and 220. He literally had 40 pounds on Edwards. And Edwards, I think, is a very different style of player in terms of what he brings on the rebounding side of, uh, side of it and I, I just think that Justin Edwards and Antonio Reeves are going to stay at that three, and Reeves may at some point work his way up to the two, depending on what happens. So, yeah, Justin Edwards, uh, I, I'm i going to give him the nod here, but it would not be shocking to me, nor offensive at all, if Antonio Reeves was the starter here. It would it would make sense. I'm just projecting out and just guessing. It could be a literal, literal 50-50 here at the three spot. At, uh, power, at power forward, we've got Aaron Bradshaw. I do think Bradshaw's going to start at, uh, at the four. I think he's going to play at the four uh, for the majority of his minutes. He's going to be able to be somebody that helps Kentucky out when it comes to rim protection and being aggressive uh, at that spot. But I, I think that he's primarily going to do it from that four spot because you're going to have Uganda and Yenzo at your five. As of right now, I think that Uganda Onyenzo is going to be one of two things. He's going to be somebody that takes a back seat to a player like Hunter Dickinson or Oscar Shibway, and that's it. Or he's a player that splits time with a player or with a with another prospect that Kentucky gets through the transfer portal. I couldn't tell you who that is right now. We talked on yesterday's show about some ideas for two, three different players that Kentucky could pursue, but they're not. Jamarian Sharp is a player that uh, Justin, uh, one of our listeners, asked about. I'm going to get to him in a second. He's still on the table, so he could be uh, the prospect here that Kentucky goes after and gets. You've got a seven footer, and then you got a seven foot five kid backing him up, or at the very least, splitting 20 20 minutes with him, right, or somewhere around there. And then on top of that, you've got Lance Ware uh, to be your to be your extra guy there uh, in the in the back in the front court, I should say. So you're starting five right now. And the reason I bring up the the depth here for Onyenzo and Sharp and where is because I don't know if Sharp comes in, it, does he start over Onyenzo? Again, it's a weird spot. So starting five, Dillingham, Wagner, Edwards, Bradshaw, I'll say Onyenzo, and then bench players, role players, Aduthiero, Reed Shepard, Antonio Reeves, a transfer power forward, and then Jamarian Sharp. And I think it would go Reeves as the sixth man. It would probably be, it would probably be, I want to say the power backup power forward as the seventh man, seventh man. No, it would be Jamarian Sharp as the seventh man. The power backup power forward is the eighth man. Shepard as the ninth man. Fierro is the tenth. Where is the eleventh? I think that's how it'd work. I hate to say that Reed Shepard's the ninth or tenth man in this rotation. Um, but that may end up being how it works out. And as we all know, um, you know, in the past, it's been a consistent theme with Cal where he will shorten a rotation. So a, a very talented player like Reed Shepard um, may not get the playing time that right now we think he should get. Now, come midway through January, we may be singing a different tune if Shepard's not playing well and DJ Wagner is, but... We'll just have to see how, how it works out. So, Hamilton, I hope you ans- uh, I answer that question for you. Again, Rob, Wagner, Edwards, Bradshaw, and in- Onyenzo as your starting five. you got to have backup transfers at your power forward and your center spot, uh, especially if Shibwe does not come back. Damian Collins, I think, is leaving. Uh, that's the one piece of the equation that I, that I kind of left out here. If he does return, Bradshaw and Collins should be a fun power forward duo. duo. But they've got to get Collins to figure out how to shoot. Uh, they've got to figure out how to get him more comfortable with the ball in his hands. Otherwise, that's going to be the Bradshaw show uh, at, at the four spot. So that's what I think about the uh, the rotation and the starting five for the Wildcats next season. If you've got any thoughts on what you think the starting five will look like, uh, you can leave that in the YouTube comments below. 
I want to get into some, to some more listener questions. Uh, one about Oscar, one about Jamarian Sharp, one about depth. Before we get to all of that, though, I want to tell you guys about our friends over at FanDuel. As you know, we've been discussing it recently. The MLB and the NBA uh, season, or excuse me, the playoffs for the NBA and the MLB season have just started. It is a perfect time to get in on the action over at FanDuel. It's America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can step up to the plate with a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. All you have to do is go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. You can place your first bet and get up to one k back in bonus bets if you don't win. You could do over-under props for baseball and basketball. They're very, very fun to do. Home runs, strikeouts, points, rebounds, assists, steals, blocks. You can do all these different things uh, with different parlays and things like that. It's very, very fun. Uh, Don't miss your chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. Again, FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. That is FanDuel, the official partner of Major League Baseball and the NBA. All right, continuing along here on the Wednesday edition of Locked On Kentucky Lance Dahl, hanging out here with you. Really appreciate you guys watching today. If you have not subscribed, please go ahead and do so. If you're listening on podcasts, please leave a review for the show. Uh, I would really appreciate it if you did that on podcast as well. And a question for you guys, if you've made it this far into the show, probably going to ask this again at some point. Looking at this upcoming roster for the 2023-24 season, who's your favorite player on roster? And let's assume that the players that have entered the portal or have entered the uh, NBA draft and may be returning, let's assume those guys are leaving. If you look at just the seven, eight, nine players that are going to be back, who's your favorite player? I'd love for you guys to leave that in the YouTube comments below, or you can hit me on the socials on Twitter at LockedOnUK. All right, some listener questions here to move along on the show. Justin, like I said, hit us up, and he asked, what about Jamarian Sharp? Be completely honest with you, Justin, he's still on the table. All right now, there's been no indication that any other school has strongly pulled him away uh, from the eyes of the Kentucky Wildcats. I believe that Ole Miss and Missouri are two different competitors to watch here. Have any of them made any significant leeway, again, to kind of uh, deter Kentucky from pursuing him further? I don't think so. I think the reason that this recruitment is so quiet at this point for Kentucky, it's very similar to Hunter Dickinson. It's very similar to everything in the transfer portal for Kentucky right now, which is they want to see what Oscar Shibway does. They want to figure it out first. But you also, I think at the same time for Jamarian Sharp, you know, he's a possibility for Kentucky. He's a possibility for Ole Miss, Missouri. He's also a possibility to return to Western Kentucky and just go back to the Hilltoppers. Or he could stay in the draft. If I'm not mistaken, he didn't just enter the transfer portal. He declared for the draft while maintaining his college eligibility. And you look at the list of schools that have offered him, or excuse me, excuse me, the this list of schools that he's hearing from, This was back on, what, April 11th, this tweet that I'm seeing from 24-7 High School Hoops. Kentucky, Arkansas, Missouri, Ole Miss, Florida, Florida State, Nebraska, LSU, UNLV, Memphis, Wake Forest, Gonzaga, NC State, Cincinnati, yada, 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 yada. It's a bunch of really good Power 6 schools. I think that Kentucky, it's similar to Hunter Dickinson, man. It's a very tall center that can do some really interesting things. Sharp, I think, would provide a lot more in terms of defensive ability. Um... If you want to get him, you can. You've got to be able to make the offer, and you've got to be able to put it on the table. It's all about what Oscar Shibwe does right now, uh, Justin. So I, I hope that answered your question. And that kind of moves us into a question from $8 million man. When would we know for sure if Oscar is coming back? And when does Dickinson have to choose a school by? If I'm not mistaken, Hunter Dickinson has until, I want to say it's May 21st to pick a school. And then when would we know for sure if Oscar is coming back? I may be off on that, by the way. I don't I, I don't know when the college basketball spring transfer portal window closes. Um, I may be completely off on that. I believe that's when it closes. As far as the NBA draft goes, the deadline for Shibwe to pull his name out and to come back after testing the draft waters 
is May 31st, I believe. And then players that are actually selected to be with it, with it or in the NBA draft, they have until June 12th to, or excuse me, not selected to be in the NBA draft, or at least they're like declaring and they're accepted to be there to potentially be picked. They have until June 12th um, to s- literally hand write or submit a, a form uh, saying, hey, pulling out of the draft, Seacrest out. So I, right now, $8 million man, we could see with Oscar Shibway really wanting to take his time in the draft process, we could see him stay in that until the final week of May. And I know that's really not what anybody wants to hear with this. And I don't want to hear it either because I want I want I want people to start making decisions so that we can decide, okay, there are some really good players in the portal right now. Let's see who we can go after and nab. I don't want to sit here and have to wait four or five weeks until Oscar Chibwe decides, like, you know what, actually, I think I'm gonna stay in the draft, guys. Um Congrats, we prevented you from getting three or four different transfer portal players that would have really helped your roster out next season. Um, and I say we, I mean Shibwe and whoever his agent is, or whoever's helping him call shots. Um, and I'm, that's projecting. Uh, right now, the situation is he could return tomorrow. He could then come back tomorrow and say, hey, you know what, actually, I really am going to stay in the draft. Y'all go get Hunter Dickinson or whoever you may choose to get. Um, but yeah, we could wait until the end of May. $8 million man. And Dickinson, I think that he will choose a school soon, probably sooner rather than later, and it will not get down to the final days before he has to pick somewhere um, after entering, entering the transfer portal. It, it's not a fun situation. And I know some people may be like, well, bringing back Oscar would be incredible. I think it would be good for rebounding. I think it would be good for ticket sales. We talked about all of this. We talked about the pros and cons of him coming back on yesterday's episode. But I can't help but think that after four years in college and and cementing a legacy at Kentucky, that a center that will be as ball dominant as Hunter Dickinson or Oscar Shibwe getting one of those guys on the transfer portal will be the most beneficial thing for this team. I don't know if it is. And I think that's not a I don't I don't think that's a hot take. I don't think that's an egregious take. I think that right now Kentucky with Dillingham, Wagner, Edwards, Bradshaw, that's four mouths to feed and honestly that's probably four too many because these guys are going to want the ball and they're going to want to score. Um right now I think on Yenzo will get his minutes, and he'll get his touches. And then a guy like Jamarian Sharp, I think, would be solid. I think a guy like Musa Cisse would be good. Um, you know, Kaden Shedrick, uh, I believe is his name, the transfer from UVA that we talked about on yesterday's episode. Those guys to split time and to not be a focal point, I think they would be good. Good selections. I've I've come around to the thinking of, we don't need an elite, you know, all-world center here we would take one absolutely we take one but we do we don't necessarily need one for the benefit of the entire team it'd be great to have that kind of depth um, but I don't necessarily know if Kentucky needs it and then that actually brings us to our final question here from Clint Darden a uh, friend of the show he said are we going to have the depth that we need next season And I think, Clint, and this is for everybody else out there as well, I think we have to look at this in a a bit of a different way based on, you know, what we all know and what I said a a little while ago here on the show is John Calipari does not run 10, 11-man rotations consistently. Most coaches don't. I'm not saying that that's something that, bad Calipari, you don't do that. I'm saying he runs tight rotations whenever things get serious, especially late February and March. Do we need 10, 11 guys that could play and on any team in the SEC to be able to just have them and balance out the rotation? I don't think so. I don't think we need as much depth as we think we do. At the same time, injuries exist, And so there's a balance that needs to happen here when it comes to recruiting some guys through the transfer portal and getting these guys that are currently coming in happy on roster where you have to figure out 
how to get everything happy and in order order having in that uh, having enough enough depth while keeping the guys that don't end up starting pleased so that they don't enter the transfer portal on you after a season um because I can definitely see a world where a guy like Reed Shepard um comes in and doesn't get uh, the minutes that he could, he proves in his limited time that he could be a really good player elsewhere. And instead of coming back to Kentucky next year, he's gone. He's like, well, this is the way that I got treated. I don't want to get treated like that again. I'm going to leave. So, Clint, when it comes to having the depth that we need next season, I think right now you have to look at what the roster is, assuming everybody's gone. Dillingham and Thierra at point. Wagner and Shepard at two, Right. Your backcourt is, I think, set. And some people may say, well, we need a backup point guard because we can't trust to do Thierro. I trust him. If we get a backup point guard, fine. Like, I'm, I'm not complaining about that. I'm just saying I'm excited about what Thierro could do for us this year uh, behind Rob Dillingham. At Justin Edwards, or it's Justin Ed- Edwards at small forward, you don't have anybody behind him right now. Aaron Bradshaw, nobody behind him. And then at center, you've got Uganda and Yenzo and Lance Ware. Um, that's not a good enough, that's not good enough depth from small forward on you need people to come back. You need to get some transfer portal guys. But they don't have to be world beaters. It's I understand the, 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 the definition of quality depth here for Kentucky. I understand wanting to have good players in your rotation. But based on the way that the system has been run, it would be nice to have a guy like Hunter Dickinson and then a guy like Uyugana and Yenzo at, at the same spot. But is that... Healthy and beneficial for all parties. I think that, I guess, is what what I'm trying to say here. I'm trying to to be realistic. Because if we weren't being realistic, we'd say, oh, well, let's get Dickinson and let's get Sheewe back. Let's let you, Gunna, and Yenzo play third string. And then we'll bring in a backup power four that was a former five-star at somewhere. And we'll bring back Antonio Reeves and Chris Livingston. We don't have enough scholarships for that. And we don't have enough. There's too many mouths to feed at that point. So it's, it's about picking and choosing. And I think Kentucky being satisfied at the end of the day um, with whatever they do. And I think they will be. I want to be clear. I think that whatever they end up doing with this roster, whether it be bringing Shibwe back, bringing in a guy like Jameer and Sharp, I think they're going to be pleased. And I think that we will be pleased in turn. Because for the final time, it does not take somebody like Dickinson to make this roster whole. You just need a body that can play some defense, I think, in your front court. And then you probably need... A backup power forward. Probably, probably. That's something that can be discussed later on. So, I think that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked on Kentucky. Again, if you've got any questions, if you've got questions on, you know, what's going on with this roster, the transfer portal, an individual player, uh, anything going on uh, with Kentucky basketball, you can leave it in the YouTube comments below. Uh, So, that's, yeah. I, I, I think that right now, we're kind of stuck in this weird period between things happening where I think people are growing a little restless with the way that things are covered. And all I can say is, we just got to wait. We just got to wait. I think that the patience is key here. Um, And I think Kentucky's going to end up losing out on a couple of guys because of that. And there's nothing that we can do except observe it and commentate on it. So, again, that's going to do it for today's episode. You can follow the show on Twitter at LockedOnUK. You can follow me on Twitter at LanceDahl underscore. And you can follow the show over on Instagram at Kentucky Podcast. Any questions, comments, concerns, hit me in the comments, hit me in the socials. I will see you all tomorrow for another episode of Locked On Kentucky. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and God bless.